What have we witnessed in our sense of call? A recognition that God has a calling upon each one of us and that um, we do well to follow in that call to experience the um, challenge and the blessing that are uniquely ours. Today, we're thinking about the reality that we um, sense God's presence if we but uh, pause and think about it, even in the ways that we are nourished. Common nourishment is an indication of the providence, the provision, and the presence of God. So I would invite you to just pause a, a, a moment and recall a time that you were very conscious of nourishment being a gift. Just call it to mind. I know uh, for Wes, uh, he became very, very conscious of this reality when uh, blockage in his intestine uh, was corrected, but for 21 days his system did not wake back up. He wasn't able to take nourishment for 21 days. When Wes's body was again able that they could feed him, well, when they, when they began to try to feed him intravenously, he had, a, he had a, what they believe was an allergic reaction to that. And so, um, yeah, it's a long time. I guarantee you, when Wes could again um, take nourishment into his body, he was radically aware of the gift of that nourishment in a way that, I won't speak for Wes, but in a way for, at least for myself, I confess, I just take it for granted day after day, this food that can go into the body and nurture the body and be the waste expelled in a proper manner. We just take these things for granted until it doesn't uh, work any longer. So we praise God that uh, Wes is now um, eating and getting stronger and walking and hopefully able to go back home this coming Wednesday. Uh, I remember um, the time in my life that I was radically aware for the first time in a new way of the gift of nourishment. It was the first time um, as a uh, young man, a youth pastor, that I did a, a four-day um, retreat up in a mountain cabin and committed myself to um, um, not eating anything. It was a time of prayer and fasting and uh, simply um, drinking uh, water and um, walking in the woods and time in the word and resting. And, and I can still remember, it's like it's seared into my consciousness, the taste at the end of the fourth day of that little bit of broth. It's like my mouth just exploded at the richness of nourishment. Nourishment. We can rest in God when we trust him to supply our every need. And we grow in our awareness of what we can witness to when we reclaim these simple gifts as evidence of God's provision. The psalmist um, pictures it beautifully in Psalm 131 when the psalmist says, may my, may my spirit be in the presence of God like a weaned child in the lap of its mother. May I be content just to be present with God. May the nursing mother have been so faithful in providing nourishment that now as a weaned child, the child's content just to be in the lap. And uh, the psalmist uses that beautiful, intimate picture to um, declare that's his intent in the presence of God, to bathe in God's faithfulness and bathe in God's nourishment. So the uh, truth reading, um, as we recognized, is uh, based on um, two different um, uh, stories, uh, one from the Old Testament, one from the New. 
the Old Testament um, continues in um, um, this um, material that um, the quizzers have been um, 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 immersing themselves in. It's the book of Exodus. And this is the familiar story of um, God, uh, after God led the people of Israel um, out of enslavement, out of slavery, out into the wilderness, and they're out there, and now um, the rough part of the journey begins. And it's always true that when God leads us into new places and wants to do something good and something new and something remarkable, um, there, there comes, a, there comes a, a hard time. Uh, a testing time, a time where basically you've got you've to press through. There's the initial euphoria of, wow, look how he dramatically delivered us. And then there's the hard work time of just trying to stay faithful to press it through. And essentially what God was doing in all of these testing times in the wilderness, what God was doing, um, God had, had, had delivered them out of slavery. And in some ways that was the easy part. The physical delivery took dramatic displays of God's power. But you know, one day they were slaves, the next day they're not slaves. But the retraining of the mind is a different matter. Um, in the wilderness, God was, um, through all of these testing times, God was trying to um, change their minds from having a poverty mindset, from having a, um, an enslaved mentality to be um, thinking of themselves as a called out, gifted uh, people of God who could own the land, establish government, operate out of abundance, and so a whole mentality had to be reoriented, and that's what um, God was doing um, in the wilderness. God was, um, at points, uh, very patient, and at points uh, rather um, exasperated with uh, the people of Israel in that um, journey, but as we know the story, um, God uh, does um, get them there. So in this wilderness time, um, we had recognized a month or so ago in preaching from this uh, series, we had recognized there was, there was uh, manna that was given and quail. There was uh, fire and cloud and presence. There was dramatic um, deliverance from uh, enemies. But uh, we hadn't uh, looked at um, this um, account from Exodus 17 where they're thirsty and they cry out to Moses. Again, um, the people hadn't yet learned that they could pray directly to God, they, they turn to their leader and um, essentially criticize the leader. And the leader, Moses, looks to God and says, God, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to help these people? Um, we're thirsty. We're out here in the wilderness. There's nothing for us. And uh, God instructs, as you know, the uh, story for Moses to um, um, strike the rock and water an abundance of uh, water flows out of the rocks and uh, becomes um, nourishment um, for the people and another indication of uh, God's faithfulness. The second story then, um, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to uh, John uh, chapter 4. This is, um, this is the beautiful story of um, the Samaritan woman um, at the well who encounters uh, Jesus. And um, we don't have uh, time today to uh, unpack. Uh, there's so much, so much uh, beauty in this story. But uh, just a little bit of uh, background before I read several verses here in John 4. Um, a little bit of historical context. The Samaritans were a despised people because essentially they were half-breeds. Um, it was uh, intermarriage between the Jewish people and the uh, surrounding um, um, uh, secular um, individuals. And uh, the Samaritans were the offspring of that uh, intermarrying. And so they were, um, they, they really had to know people. Um, they didn't belong uh, any longer with their own tribal groups and the Jews um, despised them. And so um, they were a cast out, uh, repressed despised minority. So this Samaritan woman comes out of that uh, background, out of that reality, out of that, that cultural experience. And in addition, um, in a culture where women um, were um, even um, less um, empowered and 
um, valued than they are in um, our culture. Um, so she, she wasn't only uh, a Samaritan, um, she was a woman um, in a culture where that was um, um, feared, looked down upon, repressed, et cetera, et cetera. In addition, this woman um, had been divorced. Married a man, divorced him, or he divorced her. Married a second man, divorced. Married a third man, divorced. Married a fourth man, divorced. Married a fifth man, divorced. And now the scripture says, Jesus points out the truth to her and she acknowledges it's true. He's not even, she's now living with another man who isn't um, any one of those um, husbands. And this is of course in a small town. Um, so we know that this woman um, uh, was despised for you know, all of these kinds of reasons such that she doesn't go with the other women to get water out of the well in the early morning hours. She goes the middle of the day, so she likely so she doesn't have to encounter uh, any of that um, uh, kind of uh, vitriol that would have come her way. And uh, Jesus engages her. Um, and she's amazed that Jesus engages her because Jewish men didn't talk to Samaritans. They certainly didn't talk to Samaritan women. And uh, the religious leaders would have been appalled, as were the disciples, that um, Jesus would engage particularly with such a woman. But Jesus engages her, asking her for water. And then later, as the story unfolds, um, declaring, um, woman, if you just knew who I am, you would ask me for living water. So I'll just read a few verses here um, in the middle of the story. Um, that's the background. I'll start um, at the verse 10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So, Jesus was building on this water imagery which runs all through the scriptures as a sign of nourishment, building on that to illustrate the reality that he is the living presence of God, the Savior, the Lord. He uses that imagery to say, I'm living water. Take me into yourself and you will find eternal life, a living eternity of abundance of the favor of God. Nourishment is evidence of God's provision. The second thing we recognize this morning is that God's nourishment comes in many, many forms. Now, um, I think we miss the impact of why water was such a rich and often used expression in the scriptures of um, God's provision. This was a setting, a part of the world with immense dryness, desert. And so literally, water meant the difference between life and death. We know that we can go without food for 20, 30, 40, 50 um, days without dying. Um, my brother one time did a 40-day fast. Had nothing but uh, liquids. I wouldn't recommend it, but he did. Um, you can live for a long, long, long time without food, but you can only go a few days without water. So now picture being in a part of the world where water is scarce, there's no faucets to turn on, there's no bottled water to buy. The only way to get water is to literally find the spring where the water comes up out of the ground or to have dug a well and to be able to um, get to that, get to that well. 
That's why water is such a powerful symbol. Um, but nourishment comes in many forms. It comes to us through food, through warmth, through healing, through strength. It comes to us nourishment through spiritual means, through worship, through hearing God's voice, through friendship, through laughter. Nourishment comes through natural creation. It comes uh, through, through beauty. It comes through majesty. It comes through springtime. We're about to um, experience that anew, praise God, right around the corner, I hope. Um, springtime. Um, the beauty of it. It comes through new birth, Ollie Grace. We get in touch again with the reality of um, God's um, favor and God's blessing. Ed Peabody um, sent me a YouTube um, this week and um, it illustrated perfectly the point and I think says it better than what I can. So I would invite you to um, just uh, listen and read along. Praise God for his word. But nourishment is also an evidence of the provision and the blessing of God. Let's not miss the many ways that God blesses throughout life. The final recognition is that the benefits of nourishment deepen when we recognize and respond in faith. In the Exodus story, that story is repeated in Numbers 20, but when the Numbers um, author records it, it, it tells us that um, when Moses struck the rock, he did so in anger. He didn't strike the rock in faith. He struck it in anger. And the water still flowed out, but because Moses hadn't responded in faith, he lost his chance to end well as a leader. The woman at the well, on the other hand, 
responds with faith. She runs back into the town, and fear has given way to faith. Shaming has given way to claiming. She runs back in, and the very thing that terrified her before, a whole town of people that could describe in detail the failings of her life and the ways that she had fallen short, she runs back in and she declares this reality. Come see a man who told me everything I did. Might he be the Christ? The very thing telling everything she had done had been a shaming and a diminishing and a repression. And when she encounters Jesus, it turns to faith and Jesus helps her claim her place in the kingdom because she responds to Jesus in faith. And the end of the story at verse 39, it says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus. Why? Because of the woman's testimony. She became an evangelist, a witness. She spoke up about having encountered Jesus at the well, this man who offered her living water and filled her up with the presence of God with favor. What have we witnessed? What have we witnessed? We have the privilege uh, this morning of um, witnessing another one of uh, God's evidences of uh, favor and blessing upon this congregation. Three individuals who have discerned to um, cast their lot with us They've discerned to um, formally bring membership um, to this congregation, Ruth Essek and uh, Arlen and Louise Kurtz. I would invite you to um, come forward uh, at this time. Um, Ruth um, comes to us from uh, Vincent congregation in the Vincent area. She began worshiping with us a number of years ago. Um, just uh, come right, uh, right over here uh, with me. Uh, she began worshiping with us a number of years ago, joined uh, Lyle and Tina here. Um, I think you started worshiping here basically when you moved into Tel High, if I remember correctly. And um, um, so we're delighted that she wants to um, uh, formalize her relationship with us. And Arlen and Louise um, started worshiping with us a, a while ago, a year or so, and they come to us from Churchtown uh, Mennonite. And uh, they live on a farm, um, dairy farm, along Best Road, just um, south of um, the church here. And usually when they're here, their uh, youngest son, their parents of five, normally their youngest son, um, Josh, is uh, with them. So we're going to uh, just hear a word of uh, testimony um, from Ruth, and I think Arlen's going to speak for Arlen, Arlen and Louise. I'm glad to be here. Turn and my faith has been made stronger in Christ through the many joys and life that I have experienced. I've learned to appreciate Conestoga very much, and uh, it's a very friendly church, and I, think, I don't think I should, could find another friendlier church to worship in, so continue to be uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Arlen? <clears throat> yeah, I also want to say that we are felt warmly welcomed here at Conestoga, and we decided through prayer and consideration that we would uh, make this our home church, if you'll accept this, I guess. That way. <laughs> so we, we realized your commitment and helping the community and your outreach and missions, and we like that. So, um, as the um, um, pastoral team um, recommended them to you for membership, we recognize that um, uh, each of these um, individuals were um, made a commitment to Christ uh, years ago. Uh, they were previously baptized. They've been um, being followers of Jesus um, for um, you know, over their lifetime and um, now have uh, chosen, as they just noted, 
to um, join in our mission and our ministry. So I'm going to ask you um, just uh, three um, formal questions. Um, you've previously made confession of your faith and you've been members in the Church of Jesus Christ and we rejoice in your decision to become members here at Conestoga in covenant with us as believers who worship and serve God from this place. So do you now reaffirm your faith in and loyalty to Jesus Christ, our Lord, and his gospel? If so, do you say, I do? Are you willing, do you, are you willingly, or pardon me, as you willingly unite with this church, will you by God's help worship, serve, and share in its programs, supporting Conestoga by your prayers, your regular attendance, your service, and your stewardship as God gives you strength? If so, will you say, I will? And do you promise to live and share with us in the bonds of Christian fellowship, giving and receiving Christian love, sharing and bearing one another's joy and pain? If, you, if so, will you say, I do? I do. And congregation, I would invite you to take the blue hymnal and to stand and turn to um, 777. And... Um, uh, members, if you, um, I'd like everyone, members, guests, everyone to uh, participate, but um, members, um, in your um, um, adding your voice here, um, we too, as members, are making a commitment be before the Lord with um, these uh, new members. And so I invite you just to uh, soak up the uh, words that we're now giving as an expression to you. So congregation, together, this is 777, together, as we now receive you into the fellowship of the church, we make this covenant with you as we renew our own covenant with God to bear each other's burdens, to assist in times of need, to share our gifts and possessions, to forgive as Christ has forgiven us, to support each other in joy and sorrow, and in all things to work for the common good, thus making known Christ's presence among us to the glory of God. As we unite with each other now, may we all be joined with Christ our Lord. So let me, um, well, Krista or Greg, whoever's leading the song will come forward, and I'll, uh, on behalf of the congregation, uh, welcome you into uh, fellowship as a sister and a member here, and Louise. And, Arland, um, welcome. And why don't you just um, come over and stand here and, uh, before this bench, and then after the song, I'll invite the congregation to uh, come forward and to welcome you. Krista? Okay, um, in your blue uh, hymn, the worship books, first of all, find number 458. And this uh, number 458 is a prayer of blessing for our meal that we are going to enjoy together. So put your finger in number 458 and then find number 514. Lord, I am fondly, I'm fondly, earnestly longing. Number 514, we will sing verses 1 and 3. Oh, Lord, I am fondly, earnestly longing into thy holy likeness to grow. Thirsting for more and a deeper communion, yearning thy love more fully to know. Open the wells of grace and salvation, pour the rich streams deep into my heart, cleanse and refine. Yeah. 
member of the pastoral team will be at the front for uh, offering um, prayer and uh, anointing for anyone who would uh, wish for it. I think it's Howard and Carol, yes. Um, thank you. As a reminder, we do have a uh, fellowship meal. Um, there's plenty. I invite you to stay and enjoy the uh, pork and sauerkraut. And after the benediction and the song, we just invite you, before you go get your food, to come forward and just uh, greet uh, our, uh, our new members. So we've encountered God through the waters of provision. Go as witnesses to the living water that Jesus offers to us all. In the weeks ahead, be alert to the surprising ways God's work is being revealed in simple nourishment all around.